He's not a result of a special design, a will, a purpose. He is not the subject of an attempt to attain to an ideal of man, or an ideal of happiness, or an ideal of morality. It is absurd to want to hand over his nature to some purpose or other. He invented the concept purpose. In reality, purpose is lacking. One is necessary. One is a piece of fate. One belongs to the whole. One is the whole. There exists nothing which could judge, measure, compare, condemn our being, for that would be to judge, measure, compare, condemn the whole. But nothing exists apart from the whole. That no one is any longer made accountable, that the kind of being manifested cannot be traced back to a causa prima, that the world is a unity, neither a sensorium nor as spirit. End quote. What strikes me about this selected quote from Twilight of the Idols, from a section called What Alone Can Be Our Teaching, is that it is kind of the precursor to David Bohm's ideas of the implica order. This idea of wholeness and unity. Nietzsche is known with his ideas of eternal recurrence, whereby to some degree it can relate to quantum physics, but not many, if any, have raised this comparison of David Bohm and Frederick Nietzsche in regards to wholeness, consciousness, and the implica order. On the whole, this video will mostly focus on the ideas of David Bohm as opposed to Frederick Nietzsche. Make sure to visit thoughtsonthinking.org where you can find our close-knit union of thinkers and to sign up to our newsletter. David Bohm was a well-renowned theoretical physicist who worked in the disciplines of quantum theory and philosophy. In his book Wholeness and the Implica Order, he attempts to generate an ontological concept to explain the two-sided coin of phenomena in reality that of being the implica order and the explica order. These concepts in the scientific domain were developed in order to try and explain the bizarre behaviour of subatomic particles within quantum physics, but also to try and understand consciousness and reality itself. The implica order for Bohm is an idea of enfoldment, something of wholeness which contained a deeper reality which we cannot completely perceive. On the other hand, the explicate order is one of an unfolding order which shows the abstractions of reality which humans would normally perceive that display themselves as specific. These two orders of reality fundamentally pronounce the perspective that there is an authority of structure over individual objects and that objects of particularity or individuality are only part of an underlying process. This concludes the idea in physics that quantum particles only have a relative degree of autonomy, which I will get into in a bit. Bohm believed that the implica order was the bedrock of reality and that all understood human phenomena was of a surface level reality, an explicate form which had unfolded from the underlying deeper levels of the implicate order. With this view, it is that reality emerges from the implica order. These ideas have many analogies which Bohm agreed with, for example, how the signal, screen and television electronics from a TV represent the implica order, while the image produced represents the explicate order. Another is this, consider a pattern produced by making small cuts in a folded piece of paper, and then literally unfolding it. Widely separated elements of the pattern are in actuality produced by the same original cut in the folded piece of paper. Here the cuts in the folded paper represent the implica order and the unfolded pattern represents the explicate order. Other analogies in relation to holograms are also used. Uh, I tried to get some idea of what might be the process which was implied by the mathematics of the quantum theory. And this process is what I call enfoldment, that the mathematics itself suggests a movement in which everything, in which any particular element of space may have a field which unfolds into the whole and, and, and the whole folds and enfolds it to it. Right? So you have this movement, and uh, I call this the implicate or enfolded order, which unfolds into the explicate order where everything is separate. Now, the implicate order, everything is internally related to everything. Everything contains everything, right? So everybody has ex many experiences of this implicate order. The most obvious one is ordinary consciousness, where consciousness enfolds everything that you know or see, right? And, and now it doesn't merely unfold the universe, but also you act according to that content. So therefore you're, you are internally related to the whole in the sense you act according to your consciousness of the whole. So you're not acting me mechanistically in the sense of 
being pushed and pulled by objects in the surroundings, <laughs> but rather according to your consciousness of them, you act. <laughs> Yeah. So if you're not conscious of them, you cannot act intelligently toward them. But the uh, uh, so the consciousness is really our most immediate uh, experience of, of this implicate order. And you might think of nets of consciousness that are finer and finer, or we might think of capturing finer and finer aspects of the implicate order. Right? I think there's an an intelligence that's uh, Im that's Im implicit there. You see, to say uh, that. Uh, a kind of intelligence <laughs> unfolds. Right? Yeah. The source of intelligence is not necessarily in the brain, you see, uh, the ultimate source, of the, but uh, much more uh, enfolded into the whole. Right? Now, uh, the question of what you want to call it God, that depends on what you mean by the word, you see, because uh, uh, taking it as a personal God might restrict it in some way. This all outlines the beginnings of an interpretation of physics and quantum mechanics, which Bohm called hollow movement. This key concept of David Bohm's was an approach which brought together his holistic conception of undivided wholeness, and the idea which both Heraclitus and Nietzsche accepted, which is that of everything being in a state of becoming. This is what Bohm called universal flux. The starting point for Bohm's approach to physics, or what he would call the new order in physics, is his notion of wholeness. This primary premise is the key to understanding hollow movement. This is the view that interconnected phenomena are woven together in an underlying unified fabric of physical law, or I quote, that elementary particles are actually systems of extremely complicated internal structure, acting essentially as amplifiers of information contained in a quantum wave, end quote. The law in the hollow movement or law of the whole is based primarily on order and laws of organisation. Instead of looking at or explaining the whole in terms of its parts, for Bohm, the law of holonomy is rather the opposite. Bohm, from the perspective of undivided wholeness, sees that the parts are the abstract derivatives of the whole itself. This proposes that a different perspective is needed when viewing reality using the implicit order and hollow movement. Instead of seeing reality as only in terms of external interactions between independent things, we should rather view the world or reality and its processes as an internal, enfolded relationship among things. A definite example of the implicit order would be of human consciousness, because it is internally related to everything and itself, and therefore the enfoldment of everything we know and see. Thus, individuality is only possible if it unfolds from wholeness or the implica order. The primary premise of hollow movement is this. Autonomy is limited by interaction. Therefore, relatively autonomous things such as particles, for example, are therefore associated by interaction. This association is what Bohm called the law of heteronomy, that things are not as self-autonomous as we think, that interactions act as limitation towards autonomy which alludes to the possibility that there exists a priori, a wholeness. That is what Bohm goes on to call holonomy. Holonomy is basically the law of the whole, which I quote, includes the possibility of describing the loosening of aspects from each other, so that they will be relatively autonomous in limited contexts, end quote. Fundamentally, the idea of hollow movement is essentially a different way of looking at reality, whereby reality itself is an internal enfolded relationship among things, not something of separate autonomous existences which interact between each other, because due to the law of heteronomy, things themselves can only be of a certain level of autonomy due to the existence of interaction which acts as a limiter. Bohm goes on to say that this view of reality would be of better observation in the sciences than viewing things as having autonomy against totality. I quote, Scientific investigations have generally tended to begin by relevating apparently autonomous aspects of totality. The study of the laws of these aspects has generally been emphasized at first, but as a rule, this kind of study has led gradually to an awareness that such aspects are related to others originally thought to have no significant bearing on the subject of primary interest." End quote. Another quote, he says, the actual order, the implicate order, itself has been recorded in the complex movement of electromagnetic fields, in the form of light waves. Such movement of light waves is presented everywhere and in principle enfolds the entire universe of space and time in each region. 
This enfoldment and unfoldment takes place not only in the movement of the electromagnetic field, but also in that of other fields, electronic, protonic, etc. These fields obey quantum mechanical laws, implying the properties of discontinuity and non-locality. The totality of the movement of enfoldment and unfoldment may go immensely beyond what has revealed itself to our observations. We call this totality by the name hollow movement. End quote. It's interesting how Nietzsche talked about unity and wholeness in just a short paragraph from Twilight of the Idols, how he claimed that due to this wholeness, that I quote, the world is a unity, and how nothing exists outside the implicate order or the whole. So far from what I can see, I've not come across any inkling that Bohm was ever influenced by Nietzsche. But with that said, what was Nietzsche's take on consciousness? Was it the same as David Bohm's view? David Bohm saw consciousness as the most obvious example of the implicate order, because it enfolds everything we can possibly know. I quote, Consciousness is a coherent whole, which is never static or complete, but which is an unending process of movement and unfoldment. End quote. Nietzsche sees consciousness as something which is in a process of continuous development. I quote, Consciousness is the latest development of the organic, and hence also what is most unfinished and unstrong. End quote. Nietzsche believes that due to our believed superiority with consciousness with regards to other animals, this causes many to fall into error with the belief that they don't need to further develop its domains due to its supposed quote-unquote full performance. Nietzsche points out that there is an error with our preconceived ideas of consciousness and this prevents us attaining a fast development of consciousness because the individual believes they already possess consciousness in full performance, and consequently do not exert themselves to continue its further development. I think Nietzsche's view of consciousness in error is very associative to Bohm's view of thought. Bohm believed that thought was in a sense conditioned. This is due to the ways in which the brain, in a close to material way, records past emotions, techniques, expressions relative to the past experiences which accompany themselves with a crutch of prejudices, fears and irrationalities. Therefore, both Bohm and Krishnamurti, who were both in very close association, saw thought as a form of self-deception. For example, flattery. In an interview, he gives an example of a child who attains early on bad educational experiences which make them believe they are stupid. This becomes ingrained in the mental program. But then later on, he does something really impressive, but he does not think he is gifted due to the pre-programmed thought of self-deception. For Nietzsche, when he sees that development of consciousness is prevented by our own believed thought of its superiority in existence, is in a way only maintained by a self-deceptive thought, which becomes programmed in the mind of many. Either way, both Bohm and Nietzsche see that consciousness is something which needs and can be developed but is only possible if we fundamentally reconfigure the programs which control us. Bohm and Krishnamurti says that the fatal error with thought in relation to consciousness is that when it comes to thought or looking inside ourselves, we are never directly informed with something like the senses. Something of such a nature for the mind would be of great use, but instead thought, when they come about, only have access to memory which is still connecting themselves to the program of prejudices and irrationality, which is thus still part of the program. The best way to try and overcome this is by trying to get in touch with the program which is controlling you, to help develop consciousness so that certain irrational mental programs don't deceive our abilities of the mind. I quote, Suppose we are able to share meanings freely without a compulsive urge to impose our view or conform to those of others and without distortion and self-deception. Would this not constitute a real revolution in culture? This is something he says in an interview to allow for a further understanding of his ideas. To somehow get at that program, you see, now that is not easy to get at. Because, you see, the program is recorded in the brain cells somehow, not exactly known how. And we have no... In organs inside the brain are, are nerves to tell us what the, those programs are doing, right? You can even cut into the brain and not feel anything, right? All our senses come, all our sensations come from nerves that are connected to sense organs, right? Now, uh, what Krishnamurti proposes is there is nevertheless a way to be aware of that program, uh, to be given attention, as we give attention to an object outside. You see, it's, 
the program is a material structure as this is, but one is inside, the other is outside. This thing outside, we don't depend only on memory to know what it is, but our senses also tell us something directly, right? So our thought is informed by the senses. Now, when it comes to looking inside, we haven't got any real senses, and we t depend mostly on memory, which tells us nothing because it's just the program speaking. <laughs> so what, what we can do is to observe this program reflected in two ways. We make a mirror, both in our re relationships with others, which will show us our programs, and then also watching the feelings which those programs are producing in ourselves, like fear, anger, you know, all the sensations all over the body, seeing the connection between thought and that uh, state of uh, sensation and feeling and bodily action. Hey, for example, if you're frightened, you see the whole body is tense, the heart beats faster, you may feel a sinking sensation in the stomach, and you say, I am afraid. <laughs> Now, that is the mistake. You see, you don't see that, generally speaking, any sustained fear is part of the fear program. <laughs> but you can actually see it uh, if you really give it your attention and really work hard at it. And see that uh, <clears throat> there's a connection between a certain thought and a certain fear or anger or pleasure or pain or sorrow or whatnot, right? And now, therefore, that, th those feelings become the mirror of your program. Now, with, if, with all of this, what are you saying that's much different from what a psychotherapy is in, in North America? I mean, well, they don't tell you to do this at all, you see, uh, I don't... I thought you look at yourself and you try well, to They don't tell you what, what mean, to I'd look at, you see. Uh, you see, for example, they may tell you to go back to your past and uh, find the incident which produced this thing, but that won't change the program, right? Now, if they tell you to look at yourself, they're not telling you what to look at. You see, uh, uh, if I say look at yourself, what are you going to look at? I mean, you know, you, you could say, I see that I'm, uh, I'm um, you know, in trouble on certain points, but I feel certain feelings which are me, right? See, they accept the ego, and once you accept the ego, there is no way out. You see, they accept the, rea the ultimate reality of the ego as the physicist uh, is looking for the ultimate particle. <laughs> right. <laughs> Instead of right. saying the ego is nothing but a structure in the whole, which can come and go, right? Now, the... Uh, if you say these feelings of anger, let's say you're angry, right? Somebody has said something to you, he's hurt you, and you're angry. Now you say, this anger is me, being angry, and therefore my problem is either I must show the anger is justified, right? I think the anger is justified, or I say I shouldn't be angry. Well, both of those are merely modifications of the program. You see, you're merely, your thought comes from the program, like the computer, so your thought says, I'm this anger is justified and you go on with it, or your thought says it's not justified and I shouldn't go on with but it. But you haven't dealt with the fundamental question of being angry? No, because it's on the program. See, if you had a machine which was angry, see, programmed to be angry, now, you could put on another program, don't be angry, and they would <laughs> just be fighting each other. <laughs> or you could put on a program saying it's perfectly all right to go on being angry. <laughs> okay, once you have that perception, though, that, that you're not dealing with it properly, Yes. Uh, if you just, uh, if you try to rationalize it or understand it, then what do you do at that point? Well, you see, what you have to do is to touch the actual material process of the program, right? right. Generally, when you see nonsense in a simple affair, it, it loses its power over you, you see. If you said, I thought I was going north, and I see I'm actually going south, and you say, I don't feel an impulse to keep on going north, right? But you see, if you're angry, and you're, you can see that this thing is leading you into all sorts of nonsense, but you find you can't stop it, hmm? because you haven't got to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. Now. If you can really see this thing at work, to see it is actually originating from memory, producing that feeling, then it becomes plain that it's nonsense, that there's no point to, the, uh, to just keeping this machinery going. <laughs> and and uh, in a sense, that program then is erased. Or it's just, made null and void, right? Or erased, I don't know. Have you would, actually but, experienced oh, that? Yourself? Yes, I can see it. Now, you see, it requires that you keep on giving it attention, you see. You, there's no guarantee that it won't, ha won't happen again, but when you understand what's involved, you see you can d go into it each time, <coughs> and when you've seen the basic point. Does this kind of insight have any relevance to the, the great global forces yeah. that, uh, that threaten our very existence? Well, in two ways. You see, first of all, the source of this global force is exactly the same as the source of what happens in the individual. That is the collective programs. <laughs> Right. that if they aren't changed, nothing, will, nothing can be done. You see, people have tried by every means imaginable, by religion, by science, by politics, to change this, and nothing has happened, right? It has gone on much the same <laughs> over thousands of years. 
Now, uh, somehow, that is not going to change fundamentally unless you get at the root of it. Now, as they see, the, the society has basically, is basically identical with the individual at this deep root, right? The society is nothing but the totality of individuals who are caught in this. If you enjoyed this video on a short introduction to David Bohm, make sure to like, subscribe, and comment down below to get involved in the discussion. Talking about discussion, you can find a link to the new Thoughts on Thinking Facebook group down below, so make sure to join if you want to get involved in conversations about philosophy, sociology, psychology, and literature. Make sure to follow my social medias, such as Instagram and Twitter, to keep up to date with everything that is going on, and also Patreon, where you can donate a minimum of $2. Lastly, a quick shout out to my Patreons. Thank you to Daniel Kazmi, The Truthism, Noah, Shahad, Bizham, and Walter for supporting me on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and I will speak to you in the next video.